The unusual psychological and symbolic depth of The Sopranos, along with its many unsolved mysteries, are big reasons why I feel it is the greatest show of all time. One of the show's mysteries that's been on my mind lately comes at the end of the season 6 episode, Kennedy and Heidi. At the end of a trip to Las Vegas, Tony and a female companion find themselves in the middle of the Mojave Desert at the tail end of a peyote trip. As the sun rises, there's a flash in the sky. Tony rises with urgency, triggered by the spark of a profound epiphany. He screams out into the barren desert, I get it. Hands on his head, he laughs, then cries. Then the episode ends. Like many others, this scene has always left me curiously befuddled. What exactly does Tony get, and how is that significant to his character and the show's trajectory? Let's explore that. First, some important context. The psychedelic Tony uses in the episode is peyote, the psychoactive chemical of which is mescaline. The psychedelic experience is a topic that is somewhat difficult to discuss objectively. The term psychedelic comes from Greek. Psyche refers to the mind and delos, meaning to make clear or to show and reveal. But to show and reveal what? Psychedelics are a great mystery, inhibiting a personal and subjective experience. Many swear by the ability of psychedelics to expand consciousness and provoke meaningful insights otherwise unreachable through normal modes of consciousness. Some recent research praises psychedelics for their therapeutic benefits and advocates for their use in easing depression, anxiety, and PTSD, as well as alleviating addiction. The research, however, is still in a very preliminary stage. A stigma around psychedelics still endures. Bitter memories of MKUltra, the Manson family, and the overzealous cure-all promises of the 1960s countercultural movement still linger in the public consciousness. However, it's imperative to realize that people have been tuning in, turning off, and dropping out long before Timothy Leary, Aldous Huxley, and Terence McKenna walked the earth. Peyote has been utilized by Native Americans and indigenous Mexican tribes for thousands of years, most often in religious or spiritual settings. Peyote's usage in this capacity persists to this day. In this context, peyote is not viewed as a drug, but as a medicine and as a sort of transcendent olive branch. The primary objective of ingesting it is to induce mystical visions, creating a connection to the divine and strengthening the connection to the self. This is not to say that the use of peyote or any other psychedelic is without risk. However, the argument as to whether their potential benefits outweigh the possible hazards is compelling. I would strongly encourage you to do your own research into the subject. And if you do even the most minuscule amount of research into psychedelics, you'll come across the term set and setting. Set broadly refers to the user's mindset just prior to liftoff their level of preparation, the nuances of their personality, and their current mood. Setting refers to the physical, where you are, the weather, the atmosphere, and the people you find yourself with. The outlaw Harvard professor Timothy Leary coined the term set and setting. In his book, The Psychedelic Experience, he goes as far as to say that set and setting are the foundation upon which a positive psychedelic experience is built. The chosen compound could provide a blissful experience if you find yourself in nature with friends, for example. The experience can take a sharp and malicious turn, however, if you're picked up and thrown out alone onto a chaotic street in a bustling metropolis. The nature of the experience depends entirely on set and setting, Leary wrote. So in our analysis of Tony Soprano's psychedelic epiphany, let's begin with his set and setting for his trip. The setting for Tony's trip is Las Vegas, a town built on organized crime and its gambling industry. This seems an unusual choice considering that the few prior episodes establish how Tony's gambling luck has gone completely off the rails. Tony goes to Vegas to rest up from the collective grief surrounding Christopher's death, which he obviously is directly responsible for. The conventional interpretation of why Tony kills Christopher is that through his drug use, Christopher has become a liability, and by killing him, he reduces his risk of ending up in prison. And his later fixation on the baby seat is a way for him to rationalize the heinous act. I think there's truth in this take, but ultimately, 
The Sopranos is far too subtly complex a show for the answer to that question to be so on the nose. Tony's cold, dead stare when he holds Christopher's nose is the most chilling shot in the entire series. He seems to snap into a completely different person at that moment. It could be explained away by the escalating resentment Tony harbors for Chris with his drug use and his portrayal of Tony in the Cleaver movie. But I think there's something far psychologically deeper at play here. I believe the baby seat and Chris's irresponsibility as a father spurs Tony's action. I think Tony subconsciously views himself as the baby that would have died in that seat. His murder of Christopher is the culmination of his rising resentment against his own father, Johnny Boy Soprano. And this is the set that informs his psychedelic revelation. For the vast majority of the series, Tony allocates the entire blame for his mental ailments to his mother. The reasons are clear to anyone who watches the show and do not need to be rehashed here. Interestingly, despite Dr. Melfi's occasional prodding, Tony never attributes any blame for his unfulfilling criminal life to his father. He's prickly about the subject any time it's mentioned in therapy. Although doubts about his father undoubtedly swirl through his unconscious, he never expresses them outwardly. It seems a part of his mind is defending him from consciously arriving at that realization, from tarnishing the image of the man he idolizes the most. As the psychoanalyst Carl Jung said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Tony's unconscious resentment against his father directed him toward the darkest period of his life, bookmarked by killing Christopher in cold blood and without remorse, a relative that he saw as being like a son to him. Consciously, Tony's rose-colored image of his father is that of the charming, good-humored family man, a hero cast in bronze. But we, the audience, know from flashback sequences and by virtue of the fact that he was a gangster that this is far from the whole truth. There's a turning point when Tony begins to realize that his father was not the man he remembers him as. It starts with the season 5 episode, In Camelot. At his father's gravesite, he meets Fran Felstein, his father's old mistress, someone with a reputation for being classy and who strikes Tony as being elegant, supporting his elevated image of his father. He begins spending time with Fran, ostensibly to reminisce about his beloved father, but what he discovers about his father through his conversations with Fran deeply unsettle him and begin to rock his father's legacy off its pedestal. First, there's the issue with the family dog. As a child, Tony was under the impression that Johnny had sent the dog away to a farm in the country because of his worms. Somehow, he still believes this in adulthood, another indication of his conscious mind's defense of his father. Later, Tony is distraught to learn that Johnny had actually given the dog away to Fran and her son. Second, Tony recalls when he was 16 and his mother suffered a near-fatal miscarriage. When he finally reached his father hours later, Johnny Boy was anything but urgent. He picked him up and went to visit her in the hospital the following day, opting to spend that night with Fran. In the ensuing therapy session, Melfi tries to illuminate Tony's fatherly resentment, but to no avail. Tony places all of the blame for both incidents on his mother and defends his father. At the end of the episode, Tony mentions Fran to the guys at the Bing. He grossly exaggerates her relationship with John F. Kennedy, claiming she was the president's mistress for three years when in reality, they only had a one-night fling. Again, his denial persists. He preserves his father's prestige but the seeds of doubt have been planted. Tony's growing animosity toward his father is subtly confirmed when his subconscious mind is explored in the season 5 episode, The Test Dream. For a more in-depth analysis on this episode and Tony's dreams in general, feel free to check out my prior video on the subject. One of the dreams in this episode depicts Tony in the backseat of a car being driven by his father. There's a revolving door of passengers in the car with them, Sal, Mikey Palmis, Artie Bucco, and Ralphie. Tony was directly responsible for the death of three of them. The other, Artie, was cited as a bad influence on young Tony. Tony asks his father where he's driving him. Ralph turns and replies, to the job, implying an impending hit. The dream explores the underlying reason why Tony subconsciously hates his father. 
The person Tony is sent to whack in the dream is his old high school football coach, someone who encouraged Tony in his adolescence and was, as far as we know, the only positive male role model in his life. Tony's preferred path in life was football, as a player or a coach, yet he was driven into his vapid, unsatisfying criminal life by his father. The framing of being literally driven by his father while remaining in the back seat implies a lack of agency on Tony's part. Johnny Boy was the great wind that carried him, and now he's doomed to go about in pity for himself. The coach denies Tony's lack of agency, chastising him for taking the easy way out. I suppose you blame it all on your father when you're crying to that shrink of yours, the coach says to Tony. No, more my mother, he replies. Of course, the coach chuckles, even better. The coach symbolizes Tony's unlived life and his regret for not blazing a legitimate trail for himself. Tony justifies his life choices to him by listing his achievements, his $1.2 million home, his status, his wife and kids. Those are the fruits of his criminality, of having taken the easy way out, but the trade-off comes with the ultimate stress of a piano dangling by a thin wire over his head each day. That's the gift his father left him. Tony is there to kill the coach, to silence that loud voice of regret, but he cannot. At the critical moment, his clip drops and the bullets melt in his hands. You'll never shut me up, the coach says. We learn later in the episode that this dream with the coach is a recurring one for Tony. The voice of regret for following in his father's footsteps is loud and can never be silenced. That regret is expressed as unbridled rage when Junior, a father figure for Tony, blurts out that he never had the makings of a varsity athlete. Tony's corruptions has its origins in childhood, when he was 11, and witnessed his father chop off Mr. Satriale's finger with a meat cleaver for failing to pay his gambling debts. The importance of the meat cleaver symbolism becomes more evident with Christopher's movie, Cleaver, the most prominent theme of which is revenge against a violent father figure. The meat cleaver represents Tony's baptism into organized crime and his father's guidance into that lifestyle. Chris is wearing a cleaver hat when they get into the accident. The day after the accident, Tony finds a cleaver mug in his kitchen and throws it away. The movie and the merch for it, which always seems to be around, is a constant reminder of Tony's unconscious animosity toward his father. Tony denies the trauma of the meat cleaver incident. It was a rush to tell you the truth, he says to Melfi in the ironically titled season 3 episode, Fortunate Son. The same episode when Tony's surrogate son, Christopher, gets made and his actual son shows promise in football. This was the most pivotal event in Tony's life. It was his first exposure to violence, and it created an association between violence and his mother's affection. Johnny Boy's finger chopping led to the only time in the series we see Livia in a pleasant mood, reinforcing to Tony that committing gruesome acts equals validation from the source he seeks it from the most. It began Tony's panic attacks, likely from the thought that he'd one day have to be just as violent in order to please his parents and bring home the bacon for his future family. Interestingly, Fortunate Son ends with AJ having a panic attack after being named the captain of his football team. It's also when Tony learned his father's most critical life lesson, which is to never gamble. Tony's inner resentment against his father festers throughout season six. It manifests into shame and rage in the episode Soprano Home Movies. Shame first when Janice tells the story of their father shooting a bullet through their mother's hair. Obviously, it paints their father in a less than flattering light, and Tony is visibly upset by it. It makes us look like a dysfunctional family, Tony replies before instructing Carmela to never tell the kids that about their grandfather. It morphs into rage when Tony belittles Janice and gets into the fight with Bobby. Tony loses the skirmish, but gets back at Bobby by forcing him to commit his first murder. It's a vindictive move from Tony, and it's rooted in the sense of jealousy he has for Bobby, specifically for Bobby's father and the way he shielded his son from murder, something Tony obviously wishes his father did for him. Not only did Johnny Boy not shield Tony from murder, he in fact ordered his first hit, as we learn in the season 6 episode, Remember When. The feds discover the body of Tony's first victim, and he and Paulie have to lamb it down to Florida. 
Tony confides in Paulie his uncertainty about how his father felt about him. It's funny, he says. I never knew where I stood with him, like he didn't believe in me or something. Paulie dispels that notion by reminding Tony that his father trusted him enough to give him the hit at such a young age, again connecting violence with familial affection. Paulie is another pseudo father figure for Tony. The girl he spends the night with remarks that she thought Paulie was his dad, and he replies that there was a time when he wished he was. If Tony idolizes his dad so much, how could this be? It highlights an inconsistency between Tony's image of his father and the man he objectively was, namely, Johnny's absenteeism as a parent. He didn't spend much time at home, preferring the company of someone like Fran, creating a paternal vacuum for someone like Paulie to fill, and abandoning Tony to deal with his difficult mother on his own. Tony ultimately gets cleared from culpability for his first murder, yet is still unsettled. His real issue hasn't been cleared up, and it nearly directs him toward whacking Paulie on the boat near the end of the episode. Ostensibly, it's because Paulie can't keep his mouth shut and presents himself as a liability. We're clued into the real reason when we notice that the weapon Tony contemplates using on Paulie resembles a meat cleaver. It's an excellent use of symbolism and foreshadowing by David Chase and the writers. Tony's outward frustration with Paulie has little to actually do with Paulie and more to do with his inward frustration with Johnny Boy. That frustration evolves into full-on rebellion in the later season 6 episode, Chasing It, where Tony's gambling habit intensifies and spirals out of control. It leads to him racking up a significant debt with Hesh, another de facto father figure, and leads to him lashing out against Hesh when he comes to collect. It also leads to a vicious fight with Carmella. His security with his business, finances, and family are jeopardized, and he is completely blind as to why. He's become everything his father instructed him not to be out of spite. He's become like old man Satriale with his finger on the chopping block. The subplot in this episode drives the point home. Vito Jr. is also rebelling against his dead father, and Tony is enlisted to help him. Instead of stepping up as an authentic, positive role model or shelling out the money to give the family a fresh start, Tony takes the easy way out and pays for Vito Jr. to be taken away to a camp where violence as a form of punishment is condoned. Vito Jr. is snatched away from his room by the camp counselors in the middle of the night in a very traumatic way. Tony's actions perpetuate the cycle of violence and trauma. In the episode, Melfi asks Tony what exactly he's chasing with his gambling, money or a high from winning. He doesn't really know how to answer. He doesn't know the answer. But at this point, we can begin to see it for ourselves. He's chasing a kind of revenge against his father. That brings us back to Kennedy and Heidi. Before he kills Christopher, Tony sees the baby seat and makes the unconscious connections between the two selfish, irresponsible fathers. All of the repressed resentment for his own father bubbles to the surface. Through killing Christopher, he is vicariously killing his father. He's getting his revenge for being thrust into the mob life. That's why he feels no guilt or remorse for his actions, and even feels relief. It makes sense then that Tony would continuously harp on about the baby seat after the fact, why he feels disgust for the public displays of grief surrounding Christopher, and why he would go on to sleep with one of his girlfriends in Vegas, all the while neglecting to consciously attribute any blame to his father for his upbringing. It's only when Tony stumbles into the casino, tripping off peyote, that his gambling luck turns. He couldn't stop winning if he tried. He has his first revelation at that moment. He's dead, Tony mutters to himself. He's not talking about Christopher. He's talking about his father and the mental hold he had over Tony for all his life. That resentment is, for the moment, dead, and his losing streak is finally over. The feeling of relief washing over him is so powerful that he collapses to the floor, laughing hysterically. His feelings in the desert scene are more complex. He's crying, yet his expression seems a bittersweet mix of triumph and anguish, a testament to Gandolfini's mastery of the craft. This psychedelic experience is so profound for Tony because it does what therapy could never do for him all these years. It forces him to confront 
that it was both his mother and father that are responsible for his depression and his mediocre, unsatisfying existence. That even his near-death experiences and mantra of every day being a gift cannot change what he's done and cannot change his course going forward. It answers the questions from his hospital stay. Who am I and where am I going? His window for change is over and has been for decades. His fate was sealed by his first hit. He takes the easy way out in life because it was the only way he unconsciously felt he could gain the love he so desperately craved from a cold mother and a distant father. He finally gets it. It's a cold, deterministic lens to view Tony's life and life in general. It doesn't bode very well for the future of his son. It raises the seemingly futile question of whether Tony can use the insight from his trip to change his life going forward. The insights gained from psychedelics are notoriously fleeting once our consciousness assimilates back into reality. In the following episode, Tony can't seem to articulate his experience at all, either to the guys or to Melfi. It seems to have disintegrated into the desert. In the book, The Doors of Perception, in which the English writer Aldous Huxley chronicles his personal experiences with mescaline, he writes that mescaline, quote, gives access to contemplation, but to a contemplation that is incompatible with action and even the will to action, the very thought of action. In the intervals between his revelations, the mescaline taker is apt to feel that, though in one way everything is supremely as it should be, in another there is something wrong. Mescaline can never solve that problem. It can only pose it apocalyptically for those to whom it had never before presented itself. I think this quote explains the complex emotions animating Tony's face in the desert. Tony has a eureka moment, momentarily understanding his issues in divine depth, but is powerless to do anything about them. Ultimately, Tony Soprano is the man that Christopher Moltisanti went to hell for. Johnny Boy Soprano is the man Tony Soprano goes to hell for.